All right. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the ECE colloquium. Um, uh, first, I wanted to uh, welcome all of you to the winter uh, quarter of the colloquium. This is the first talk in the series. Uh, if you're taking uh, this as a accredited course, please make sure to sign up at the sign up sheet at the back of the room. Uh, the sign up sheet will, will be removed by 10 for, uh, 1035, so please sign up. Um, uh, and today it's a pleasure to welcome Kevin Jamieson as our speaker. Uh, it's a particular pleasure because Kevin, in fact, is one of the alumni of our own department. He got his bachelor's degree in ECE at UW and then uh, continued by a master's at Columbia University and PhD at University of Wisconsin. And uh, now he's a uh, assistant professor in the Computer Science Engineering, uh, Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering. Um, his uh, research involves uh, various areas of machine learning, but in particular, active learning. And that's one of the topics we'll talk about today. Uh, so join me in welcoming Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. Can everyone hear me in the back? Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, it's a pleasure. Uh, to speak to you. I sat in this room many times as an undergrad um, and heard uh, lectures. I hope mine uh, meets the bar. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about exp adaptive experimental design. Um, but uh, this work is actually going to span uh, a few papers and research efforts, um, most notably with uh, my close colleague, Lalit Jain. Uh, he was my postdoc up until a few weeks ago and when he started as a professor here at the business school. Uh, in UW. Um, but also, uh, this research with Tanner Fies, graduate student in UCE, and Lillian Ratliff, a professor in UCE as well, uh, all here at UW. So I want to open up this talk with uh, you know, a story. So an all too often story you hear is um, there's some legacy company, some legacy agriculture company that has decades of data. You know, they, they put down different fertilizers and waters and seed plants and plans on different crop rotations, and they've gotten the results, right? When they did this, they got this much yield. When they did this other thing, they got this other much yield. And you know, these companies often will look at New York Times and these sort of things and read like, oh, wow, deep learning, machine learning is revolutionizing everything. I'm sure that I'm leaving money on the table. We can eke out a little bit more performance um, by utilizing these high-tech tools. And I, I don't disagree with that. Um, but often what they'll do is they'll hire some uh, ML engineer, some expert, you know, some firm maybe, like DeepMind or something. And they'll often be interested in three questions. One, the first and foremost is estimation. They've got a, a, a variety of different plans that they can do, different crop rotations, different crops they can put down, different uh, watering rotations, different uh, seed they could buy. And they're just interested in any given one, if I were to give you some candidate uh, crop rotation or plan, how well is that one going to do? Can I estimate the yield of any given particular plan? But of course, they're not just interested in just estimating, they're also interested in the optimization, right? That's why they're doing this. They are trying to figure out what is the plan that's going to yield the most amount of crops or money or whatever uh, they have. So they're trying to optimize over different plans. But they're also interested in testing because you know, they could either go with the expensive Monsanto seed, or they could go with the cheap seed that the local guy sells uh, in town. And they want to know, does it actually make a difference? Is there actually a difference in using that, the, the cheap or the expensive seed, or putting this much water over there or this much water over there? Can they skimp and not lose anything? That's a, fundamentally a testing question, a hypothesis testing question. And more often than not, the ML engineer will, will crunch on the data, apply the state-of-the-art models, you know, LSTMs, deep learning, et cetera, et cetera. And they'll come up, uh, if they're a good statistician, they'll come up with a final answer of, your data is inadequate. You don't have the right data. You don't have enough of the right data in order to answer these questions, even if these, these legacy firms have decades of, recent, decades of data. They think they have lots of data, but they have the wrong data. And while I'm telling this story in 2020, uh, apparently in you know, today's world, this is actually exactly what happened uh, to Sir Ronald Fisher 100 years ago, almost to the day. So there was a legacy uh, agriculture uh, research firm 
in, uh, in England, and they asked him exactly these questions. And basically, he discovered that you don't have the data to answer these questions with any statistical accuracy or confidence. But he did one more thing. Instead of just saying you're screwed, he went and actually told them, this is how you should do it. If you want to answer these questions, you should be collecting data like this. And it really changed fundamentally. Uh, we call Sir Ronald Fisher this father of modern statistics because what he said was basically, you cannot collect data and then ask questions about your data. You should ask the questions first and then collect data in order to answer those questions. A directed uh, and very deliberate data acquisition plan or experimental design. And so what I want to do in this talk is basically talk about you know, what, what has happened over the last 100 years. Where are we now today uh, with these, answering these different questions? And where do we have left to go? And along the way, I'll highlight some of my research that has um, contributed to some of these answers. So to demonstrate how this sort of works, I want to go through a very simple example. Uh, I uh, usually bike to work. And there's one thing that's always bugged me is, did I actually fit my bike properly? Um, because there's a lot of different attributes going on here. You can, uh, there's the seat can be forward or back. The post height can be high or low. The stem height can be high or low. If I'm trying to maximize speed or you know, efficiency in some way, is it better to be in a high gear and pedal slowly or better in a low gear and pedal faster? What's actually optimal in order to optimize this performance of this bicycle? And more, and one thing that's always vexed me, particularly on a day like today where it's nice and icy out, is do I invest in the expensive tires or the cheap tires? Because tires are very expensive. You can buy $15 tires. You can also spend $150 on a tire. Does it actually make a difference? And if I'm actually only caring about speed around a track, does it make a difference to the speed? So I'm going to treat this as an experimental design problem. I have different attributes. I have five different attributes. They're all binary. And what I, so if I have five different attributes, they're binary. That means there's two to the five, or 32, total configurations of this bicycle that I can try and get some amount of performance out of this bicycle. And what I want to do is figure out things about this. I want to do testing questions. I want to do optimization questions. So what I'm going to do, the test bed here, is I'm going to put the bike in one of these configurations. I'm going to, in a trial, I'm going to define as around, I'm going to ride my bike around some track. I'm going to time myself. I'm going to get some number at the end. But of course, due to the fact that there's you know, wind, there's, uh, I, you know, I'm flum, I'm, I, I screwed with the, the timer when I didn't get it exactly when I finished the finish line, there's some amount of errors associated with it. And I'm going to lump all of those errors up into some, some single uh, Gaussian uh, uncertainty parameter, which uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'm always going to assume Gaussianity, but uh, please trust me, all of this extends to arbitrary distributions. Um, in particular, it, the most easy extension is just a, any bounded distribution or sub-Gaussian distribution, um, but uh, honestly, a lot of this also extends to heavy-tailed distributions. But again, just for simplicity of exposition, I'm just going to talk about Gaussian errors. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to put my bike in some configuration, this uh, one of these possible configurations, negative one to one to the five, so some hypercube. And then I'm going to ride my bike around the track, get some noisy measurement of that track time, and I'm trying to answer questions about this. Now, as one often does, I'm going to simplify the problem a little bit. Because if I look at my bike, if I change the tires, if I keep everything else constant and I just change the tires, Really, that's only going to change that one parameter. And somehow, these tires are independent. It, whether you're using the expensive tires or the cheap tires, it's, the performance of this bike is independent of what, those, uh, what, I'm going to be, what are going to be. In the sense that if I change the tires and I change the stem, the effect of the tires is somehow independent. But what's not independent, there might be interaction effects between, say, the stem height and the post height. Right? If I make this higher, I might need to make this higher as well, or things like this. And so what I'm going to do is I'm not going to uh, get rid of all these interaction effects, but I'm going to say that only the first two interaction effects matter. Meaning that if I raise the seat post, the seat post and the stem pipe can interact, but there's no three-way interactions, higher interactions. This is an extremely reasonable assumption in practice. 
um, because empirically this is observed over and over and over that these higher order interactions are negligible. And so very explicitly, I'm gonna say that when I put my bike in this configuration, there is some parameter for the bias, there is some uh, linear term, so if I change out the tires or not, if I put the seat post higher or not, there's some coefficient for that, that in influences the performance, and then there's these interaction terms. If I put the seat post high and I put uh, the stem, stem post high, then there's some coefficient that interacts with that. And then of course I get this Gaussian additive noise. This is a inconvenient uh, form, and so what I'm gonna do is actually expand this into a vector. So for all these coefficients theta naught and theta one, theta two, I'm gonna ex just expand this whole sum out, put this whole vector of thetas that I don't know into a big vector theta star, call it theta star, it's a fixed, which includes the bias term, the linear terms, the interaction terms. And then for each A, I'm going to define a vector of just negative ones and ones that encodes this. So all I'm saying is that this, this expression here can be perfectly encoded by some xA that's a negative one one and some vector theta star plus Gaussian noise. Okay, this is just a, a nice notational thing that'll make the rest of the talk a lot easier. And so the total dimension here of this inner product, I'm going to put the, I'm going to choose one of these uh, appropriate A's, construct my vector xA, it's some vector negative one one in 16 dimensions, and then I'm going to get some Gaussian error. Now there's two things that I wanna say about this, this model. One is this model is actually very reasonable, meaning I actually believe it. These are not like, you know, I'm computing capsule coefficients from songs on Spotify and it's, you know, I get some vector out and then I do some linear approximation and I say, yeah, it's probably a good model. I actually believe that this is going to be a pretty decent model for the truth. And more than that, I, the coefficients of this thing actually have meaning attached to them. So I can actually talk about counterfactuals. I can say, if I made this change, what would happen? What if I could actually get you know, a better tire? If I can improve the tire out by a lot, what would happen then? Um, and so these are the kind of questions that make it very valuable to look at these sort of linear models um, that, and why linear models are still very, very useful in these experimental design literature. And so now that I have uh, I can now just in general say I have some set of vectors x. They're just an arbitrary collection of uh, vectors x in R16. I'm going to measure one, I get some noisy response, which is just the inner product between that vector x and theta star, which is unknown, and I get some plus additive Gaussian noise. In this estimation problem I was talking about with the agriculture example, you know, how much would each crop yield? Well, this is saying, well, for any given x in my set x, this is any configuration, how well would that one perform? If I put the bike in that configuration, what is the expected performance of going around that track? That's an estimation task. Optimization task is okay. There is a, I have this collection of X's. Which one has the largest inner product with theta star? Because that's the, what is the X that has the expected best uh, performance if I put the bike in that configuration? If I'm trying to max my speed, that's the question I'm really interested in, optimization. And the last sort of question I might be interested in is testing. Does it make a difference whether, the, whether I use the expensive tires versus the cheap tires? That's just a linear term. And so I put this, it's just a canonical vector, just an all zeros vector with a one in one of these positions. And I'm just saying, is that coefficient zero or not? Because if it's zero, that means explicitly that the expensive tires and the cheap tires make no difference in this. And that's a hypothesis testing question. And now the question is that, I mean, so each of these x's are in 16 dimensions, but there's 32 of them. Right, so I have 32 possible measurements. They're noisy, meaning I have to repeat them multiple times very likely. But I have 16 degrees of freedom, and so I'm over-parameterized. What that means is that some of these measurements are probably much more informative than other ones, and I might want to take some way more than others. So how do I choose them? How do I choose which measurements to take in order to optimize this process? Meaning, how do I figure out what the best configuration of the bike is going around that track using as few total measurements as possible? making a decision faster. So let's, for a minute, take a break and talk about least squares, uh, just so everyone's on the same page. So we will review for a lot of you. I, I uh, apologize, but it's important that everyone's on the same page. Suppose that someone, I just, let's say I, came and told you, go measure these x's. So put the bikes in these different configurations, take all your measurements, and each of those measurements, put those into vectors y. 
right? So these x's are your, your measurement vectors, the configurations. Your y's are scalars in uh, R. Now what I'm going to do is stack all those into matrices. So I'm going to stack all my x's, x's into a uh, big matrix x. So there's a, a t by d matrix, or a t by 16 if we're going through, uh, with the going example. And then y is a, a t by 1 vector. Okay, and we're just going to perform least squares. What you would do with any signal processing 101 sort of uh, example. And when we do that, we know the solution. It's just the pseudo inverse. And now what we do is that's our least squares solution. We do a little bit of algebra. We use the fact that uh, we, know, we believe our model that y is equal to x theta star plus epsilon, where epsilon is this Gaussian zero identity noise. And then what we conclude is that through a little bit more algebra, that theta hat minus theta star, basically this is our error, how far off is theta hat, our estimate from the true theta star, it's Gaussian distributed mean zero vector with covariance x transpose x inverse, where this matrix x again is my stacked uh, vectors that I chose to go and experiment with. Okay? Now, I want you to pause for a second and, and realize how re uh, remarkable that is. The covariance, the uncertainty I have with respect to the truth of my estimate depends only on the vectors x that I chose, the, vect the, the configurations that I chose to put the bike in. It does not depend on the underlying theta star, and it does not rely on the underlying, uh, on the, the y's that I observed. This means that I can go and take my, I, before I take any measurements at all, I can tell you what the uncertainty is going to be of those measurements of my theta hat. And this is really the principle that underlies all of optimal linear experimental design. And so if I were to build a 1 minus delta confidence set for theta hat, meaning that with probably 1 minus delta, if this is theta, set, theta star, the truth, with probably 1 minus delta, theta hat will lie in this confidence ellipsoid. Then if I choose my x's to look like this, meaning they're very strong uh, or very correlated in this direction, they're wide in this direction, I'm going to have short covariance in that direction. And since I have not very much data in this direction, I have a large covariance in that direction. Okay? And you can do this all day. If I change the shape of the x's, I change the shape of this covariance matrix. So that means I can shape what this uncertainty around theta hat and theta star is going to be. And I can strategically choose x to shape this covariance before I've seen any data at all. So going back to the estimation question, if I wanted to figure out how much does each crop yield, each crop plan, or how much each configuration of the bike is going to yield, or how, much, how, how fast is each configuration of the bike going to be, just an estimation question, I know how to do that. That's equivalent to just saying, like, well, I just want to minimize the variance, say, of my estimates. Because I know that my theta hat's going to be unbiased, so if I use theta hat in a product with x, that's going to be an unbiased estimate and so all I'm really asking is, let's minimize the variance. All right, so for any given x, this is the variance of that estimate of uh, theta hat transpose x. And so what I want to do is I want to choose my design matrix x as to minimize the worst case variance, because this is the variance of any given x. This is the worst case variance uh, over all possible x's that I'm considering. And I'm minimizing over all possible designs, all possible choosing of which configuration I'm going to try to minimize this variance. And doing just a little bit of algebra, uh, using basically these facts up here, you can show that this can evaluate to this here, which is minimize over your design, maximizing for x, x transpose, x transpose, x, x, x. Now, for those experts in the audience that have seen a little bit of experimental design in the past, uh, you would recognize this objective function here as g optimal design. Uh, you can you may also recognize or know by the kiefer wolfowitz theorem that G-optimal design is exactly equivalent to D-optimal design, which is a, a stalwart of signal processing um, and mass and likelihood estimation. Um, basically, this it all comes down to uh, the Fisher information matrix, which started this whole talk. Um, but that's, I'm going to try to avoid that whole discussion today. Um, today, we're just going to be talking about covariance matrices. So, excellent. I feel like we've kind of solved it then. I mean, I just told you you can choose the design before, to minimize the variance before seeing any data at all. This problem seems sort of solved. At least for linear, that's true. 
and at least for estimation. But what about for optimization? This is just one problem. Estimation seems to be easy, and there's been many, many, many textbooks written about this. Optimization is a little trickier. Because if I want to identify what the best x is of my set, I'm really trying to understand what is the x that has a large standard product beta star. So let's draw some pictures. If we have x1, x2, x3, I know before I was saying the x's are in negative 1, 1, but this is just a picture. They can be arbitrary and rd. It really doesn't matter. So these are my vectors, x1, x2, x3. I've only got three configurations. And now what this picture denotes is that if theta star is in this blue region, if theta star is anywhere in this blue region, x2 is, has a large inner product. If theta star is anywhere in this purple region, x1 has a large inner product. And in this pink region, then x3 has a large inner product. Okay? And now, given this picture, what we need to do is simple. You need to localize theta star within this region. You need a theta hat. You need to choose your x's to estimate your theta hat to get some confident ellipsoid that is completely within this set. Now, if you're not within this set, you can have a situation like this. So let's say someone gave you some configuration of x's. Uh, it defines some covariance matrix, which induces some confidence ellipsoid of how certain you are about this theta hat or theta star. And now in this situation, this confidence ellipsoid overlaps both the x1 region and the x2 region. What that means is without any statistical confidence, can I say that x1 is the best or x2 is the best because either one could be the best. Theta hat could be anywhere in this confidence ellipsoid. It is ambiguous. So you can rule out x3 because this, this confidence ellipsoid does not include this region here, but it does include regions of the space of x2 and x1. Therefore, it's ambiguous. However, using some other plan, say some other measurement pl uh, plan in different proportions of choosing different uh, configurations, I could have gotten a different configuration, perhaps with the same number of total measurements, meaning the total amount of effort that's been done is the same. But just by choosing them more strategically, I shape the covariance in such a way, I basically, by going from this one to this one, I've sacrificed some amount of certainty in this direction, but then short it up in this direction. And now it is unambiguous. Now this confidence ellipsoid lives entirely in this x1 region, and so I know that x1 is the best configuration. And so the challenge here is that without knowing theta star a priori, I don't know how to shape this covariance. This theta star hasn't moved, but based on the location of theta star, I should want to shape that covariance in a different way. I should choose different x's. So we've got a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. Um, to know what the best sampling pattern is, I need to know theta star. But to estimate theta star, I need to sample it. And so uh, what do we do? And so optimization has this problem where we actually don't know how to solve this problem optimally. Testing is the same issue. If we just, had issue, if we just wanted a test of E2 greater than 0, E1 greater than 0, uh, we can, this is the confidence ellipsoid for here. We can unambiguously decide that uh, E2 is greater than 0, but not E1 because it intersects. But some other measurement budget could have uh, unambiguously decided this hypothesis test. So the point is, is that while estimation is somewhat of a solved, plan, uh, a solved problem in experimental design, uh, optimization and testing is not. We don't really know how to do this. So how does one adapt their measurement plan over time in order to adjust their, their sampling patterns in order to optimally uh, identify theta star, as if you were to know theta star in the beginning to do the optimal plan? How do you do it? So experimental design, like I said, is a mature field. It's over 100 years old. And there's many excellent books on the topic, ranging from very applied to very theoretical. And uh, so these books must deal with this issue, of course, and they do um, in, in one way or another. Uh, a lot of more theoretical texts just ignore it. Uh, they do punt on it because it's, it's somewhat of an open question. But the more practical textbooks can't, right? They're actually giving these to practitioners that wanted the answer to these. And they take sort of one of two approaches. Either they say they change the problem. They say, ah, oh, what you really want to talk about is regret, which is a completely different problem, which is more like I want to sell you ads and get as much reward as possible. But this is inherently an inference problem, a pure expression problem. So this is just not answering the question. But more often than not, these books will actually um, do what I refer to as uh, be fair weather frequentists in the sense that 
They start with a very frequentist problem. And we're talking about Fisher here. He is the father of frequentism. And then what they'll do is they'll, be, they'll say, well, I don't know what to do with this, but I'm going to put my Bayesian hat on for a while. I'm going to pretend there's some prior distribution. Now I can talk about information gain. I'm going to pick the uh, measurement that's going to maximize my information gain about what is the uh, largest inner product. So we're getting a little bit of information theory here. Um, and so once they pick that point, they're going to then evaluate that point. They're going to recompute their theta hat. They're going to recompute their p-values and these sort of thing, things for testing. And they're going to get some conclusion. This is a complete disaster. This happens all the time um, in real science. But it is a complete disaster. And it is actually, it is, this fundamental issue is what's responsible for things called p-hacking. And all these are issues where you have got some data independently. You've realized, you've looked at that data and then decided what you're going to do next based on that data, got new data based on those observations, and then pretended, incorporate all the data together, pretending that it was all independently collected, and then making a conclusion. You cannot do this. This is statistically totally invalid um, and can cause serious, serious problems. Um, and so a lot of these questions are just totally unresolved. And why? If it's 100 years old, how has no one resolved these sort of issues? One is because experimental design has typically worked in the, on, the, on the order of like tens of samples, or hundreds of samples. It's a practical field. It's an unapologetically applied field. They know their confidence intervals aren't right. They know their p-values aren't right. But it's just the best they can do. But what's changed in the last 10 or 20 years is the internet and high throughput biological screens where you can now be in the tens of thousands or hundreds, hundreds of thousands of data samples without a problem. And now, once these companies like Amazon are making decisions in the millions of dollars based on these kinds of tests, they want to have some statistical rigor in what they're doing. They, want, they can actually put in the time and the money to get the right answers and get the right, what genes are you going to actually go and uh, seek out in order to invest all that money into doing those expensive experiments. Um, because we have the amount of data to actually validate this kind of stuff. And so this is actually where I'm coming from towards coming back to this experimental design literature over the last 100 years, is we, now that we have the measurement sizes that we can actually do real rigorous statistics, uh, how do we be adaptive? And so that's what I'm going to basically talk about today in that 30-minute intro, essentially, uh, into some research topics that I've worked on um, and towards this optimization question and also this testing question. How do we figure out you know, what tires are effective or what genes are effective and go to chase those down? How do we do these questions adaptively? So let's jump in uh, to the optimization question. So uh, I work in a field known, uh, I like to call it adaptive experimental method design, but um, this encompasses many subfields known as active learning or uh, adaptive sensing um, or multi-armed bandits. And multi-armed bandits uh, is a, a huge field that has exploded over the last couple of decades due to e-commerce, trying to sell you better ads. When ads are chasing you around the internet, that's a bandit doing that. That's a bandit algorithm, chasing you around, trying to show you what you've done in the past or similar things to it in order to get you to click on things um, as effectively as possible. And so I have worked at, on these problems from a more pure exploration inference side of things instead of a uh, maximizing cumulative reward. And they look like this. So this game is called Linear Bandits. And we start with a set of vectors x, right? Just like we had our configurations of our bikes, we have some set of configurations x that we're interested that we can go and evaluate uh, and get some observation from. And it takes some input delta, some confidence delta. And how the game works is at sequentially in time, the learner will choose some x among his set of uh, x's. Nature will reveal some yt, which is the inner product of the chosen xt with the truth theta star plus additive noise. Let's just say Gaussian noise for simplicity. And how the learner has to play by, what are the rules? He has to, he's defined by a selection rule, which xt does he choose at each time? But then at some point in the game, he has to stop and say, OK, the whole point of this is to stop as soon as possible, to take as few measurements as possible while achieving the task. So at some point, the learner has to have some stopping rule that he defines. 
and then has some recommendation rule which decides which x hat are you going to recommend. And we say an algorithm is delta correct if at that stopping time tau, if x hat is estimated uh, x is equal to the true best, then uh, it has to be greater than one minus delta. You need one minus delta of the time where delta is very small, this algorithm is correct. Okay, so I'm just rewriting some useful facts on this slide. If I define x star as being this true best, right, there's one unique element I'm assuming that is the true best configuration, then x star is also the unique element that satisfies this set of inequalities, meaning that if x star has the highest inner product of theta star, then that also means that theta star x star minus x is greater than zero for all x not equal to x star. This is a trivial sort of statement. Uh, I'm not doing anything fancy here. And just to remind you, these regions are everywhere theta star has the biggest inner product of x2, biggest inner product of x1. These lines here are exactly <coughs> just x star minus x. It's those hyper, that's what defines these hyperplanes um, in higher dimensions. And then of course I'm doing everything in two dimensions, but it extends to arbitrary dimensions. And so, if I need to find some x star that has the largest inner product with uh, theta star, all that I really have access to is theta hat when I take some measurements. And so what I'm gonna do, the only natural thing to do is to estimate theta hat, I'll put the x, that, the x hat that has the highest inner product with theta hat as my estimate and hope for the best. And so when is that wrong? That's wrong when this, when a, for any x, if this guy is less than zero, right? Because if this is greater than zero for all other x, then I have, because this is the true x star, then I have, I have identified the best uh, configuration and I have not made an error. And now what we have going for us is that this is the true effect size. This is the true sort of uh, effect size of x star minus x, the true difference. That's some positive number because x star is by definition the best, it's a positive number. And this is a zero mean aired quantity, right? Because this is theta hat minus theta star. But here we know this is a Gaussian random vector, zero mean. So a zero mean random vector, inner product with any fixed vector is going to be a zero mean uh, random variable. So this is just a scalar, a random vector with a fixed vector. It's a scalar, one dimensional uh, random variable with some mean and covariance. It's a mean zero random variable with some covariance. Well. It's a, mean zero random, it's a mean zero random variable, but it's also Gaussian random variable. And so when so we know it's a random variable that's a Gaussian, I can put a tail bound. I can lower bound this quantity with high probability. I say with high probability, this quantity is at least as um, large as negative this quantity here. Don't let that scare you. If you just work out the math, that's what it, it, that's what it turns out to be. Okay? And now what I need is very simple now. I want to choose my x's. There's nothing random now on this line, right? All I have is the x's that I get to choose, and the x star, and theta star, and x. There's nothing random here. I don't know what theta star x star is, but we'll leave that for a moment. So all I really need to do is choose my x's so that this quantity, this whole square root quantity, is less than this quantity, because then I'll be good. Then I'll prove that theta hat, if I just do the highest inner product, will be correct. And so my external design is just to choose my x matrix in order to maximize uh, this quantity, or sorry, I'm gonna choose my x such that the, the worst case x has less than one over two logarithm delta, which is just the condition that this quantity is less than this quantity. That'd be a sufficient condition to be correct. So I've rewritten it here. This is the sufficient condition to be correct, how I should choose my x's. I'm gonna just multiply both sides by n. I've done nothing. n is just the size of x. Uh, the total number of measurements I'm going to take. So I've done nothing. But now what I notice is that this guy here, one over n times x transpose x, x transpose x is a sum of outer products. It's a sum of n outer products. So by, by normalizing it like this, I've sort of taken scale out of it. And now it's just a convex combination of outer products. And then I can just rewrite it like this. For some lambda, this is just a, for some lambda in the simplex, this is a convex combination of outer products, so I'm just rewriting and replacing x, x transpose x over n by an explicit probability distribution. And now what I'm doing is I'm defining rho star as that quantity. I'm optimizing over all lambda to minimize the maximum quantity of this because this is a sufficient condition to min if this is smaller than this quantity here. 
Turns out, you can prove that under Gaussian noise, rho star is fundamentally a, a speed limit. It is a lower bound on the sample complexity. This is information theoretic. This means that any algorithm on this problem, if you, if you have an algorithm, you claim, I will be able to identify the best arm or the best configuration uh, using a small number of samples, then I will say, OK, I don't care what your algorithm is. I don't need to look at it because I have an information theoretic lower bound that says your algorithm cannot possibly identify that, that configuration with fewer than this total number of observations. Right? And so this is extremely powerful. This tells us uh, that I don't need to even know what your algorithm is. I know there's a fundamental speed limit on how well your algorithm can do. And what's important is that this lambda is lambda here, this, this distribution over my x's, if I sample x's according to that distribution with a number that's equal to rho star log 1 over delta times you know, some small log, uh, constant factors and log factors, I can actually recover the best arm, the best configuration. Meaning that this is somehow the right quantity to look at. It's a lower bound, but I'm saying if you gave me theta star and I could compute lambda star, this, this solution, then and I sampled according to it, then I could actually uh, recover this lower bound, essentially. So this is somehow great. But of course, we don't know theta star. You don't know theta star, so you can't compute lambda star, and you can't sample from it, and you can't compute theta hat. So what do you do? What we're going to do is use this insight from the first few slides of this knowledge of experimental design that I know I can shape the covariance without seeing any observations in the, in the beginning. I know I can shape the covariance, what it's going to look like, uh, just based on choosing the vectors that I know. And I'm going to do this in stages. And how, to give you some intuition for this, suppose, this is just math, but basically, suppose that I told you that all gaps with greater than 2 to the minus L are gone. I got rid of those. Like you're, so I've, I've solved the problem up to 2 to the minus L. And you just need to solve the problem of the 2 to the minus L plus 1, meaning all those with um, the gap to the best of 2 to the minus L plus 1. Then you could define the optimal sampling distribution here, uh, basically just solving the equivalent of rho star just over this smaller set. I'm just rewriting it. This is a notational thing. But now each one of these, you've just told me that each one of these is lower bounded by 2 to the minus L plus 1, so it can come outside. I still don't know what x star is but I can upper bound it by maxing over all xx prime in this set that's at least 2 to the minus L good. And I have this final optimization problem here. So I went through this fast, but the main point here is that if someone were to come to me and say, I have removed all the guys that are uh, just really terrible, and now I just want you to get a little better, a little better solution. What this is saying is that I can perform, this is that optimal optimization, how to do that optimally. And what I can do here is this optimization only involves parameters that I actually know. There's no theta star in this expression. There's no x star in this expression. This only involves expressions that I know. There's only involved quantities, and I can actually compute this. So what this says, and the big takeaway here is that by doing some fancy math, I can actually reverse all these inequalities up to constants. Meaning that this optimization here, if we're doing this in stages, this expression that I don't know how to optimize because it includes all these things I don't know can be up and lower bounded by an expression that I can actually compute with the things that I know. And so what I'm saying is that I can now use this trick to just successively remove things uh, at a time. So I'm going to start with all my configurations. I'm going to remove, say, the worst half and then remove the, the second worst half and the third worst half and the fourth worst half just shelling down, getting down in each stage, down, cutting out about half of your arms. And that's a basic, if half your configuration. That's essentially what this algorithm is doing. At each time, you're, comp you're computing this optimal uh, sampling distribution, which is using classical experimental design. You're removing the bad, uh, you're computing your theta hat, and you're removing your bad uh, configurations. And you're just doing this like shelling. And of course, uh, we have a theorem you can prove that you can actually achieve rho star. You can identify x star with high probability using a sample complexity, number of samples, when does it stop um, rho star times some ugly, ugly log factors. 
Uh, now I'm just going to rewrite this on this slide. So just to remind you, rho star log one is the lower bound on this problem, and the upper bound is this rho star uh, log one over delta. So they look the same here, but then you've got some extra factors here. This is unavoidable. This is an artifact of the proof that I don't know how to remove, but I'm sure is not actually there. Um, this is very real, and I'll get back to that in a second. Um, but just to remind you, uh, basically, uh, any non-adaptive algorithm would require a sample complexity of at least this, uh, which is something where delta is the minimum gap. And to give you some intuition, uh, if we had this problem like this, I would put uh, uniform weight on x1 and x2, get some confidence ellipsoid, this confidence display does not include the region of x2 anymore, so I can completely throw out x2. It's just x1 and x3. x3, x1. I put the configuration of that. I put weight on those. I get some confidence display there, and I'm done. Because it's completely enclosed in x1. And how has the configuration changed over time? And the difference between non-adaptive in this particular example in higher dimensions is something like d over epsilon squared versus adaptive is d plus 1 over epsilon squared. So it's a factor d difference which can be a huge deal if D is, say, 16. You know, finding the right answer using a factor of 16 fewer questions is actually uh, quite a lot. Um, if I could do that for every problem, that would be amazing. Uh, we have experiments. It works. It kills everything uh, in the literature. Uh, it's an algorithm that actually works, um, but I'm not going to go any further into that. So, what I'm saying is we've essentially gotten to a point where we didn't know how to do with the estimation. Or so we, we know how to do estimation because that didn't require any knowledge that we didn't have. Optimization somehow required the knowledge of theta star. And we need the, uh, awesome theta, the optimal theta star. We, yeah, we need knowledge of theta star in order to find the optimal allocation, the optimal design. But we needed to perform some measurements in order to estimate theta star. And so the, what we did is we essentially just traded these off uh, in stage-wise uh, successive stages of experimental design, and we can prove that it's actually optimal. And now there's lots of details with how many measurements you take per stage and things like this, and what are exactly these constants, um, but more or less that is the main idea of this uh, sort of scheme. And can we do the same thing for testing? Yeah, more or less. Uh, for these testing problems of hypothesis testing, do we have, uh, you know, do tires actually matter or not? Can I adaptively take measurements in a successive experimental design in order to solve these questions? Yes. You can. Um, but you'll realize that in the testing literature, they really care about log factors. So if you are, are at all familiar with multiple testing, you're probably familiar with Bonferroni correction and Benjamin Hodgeberg. And in this literature, the Benjamin Hodgeberg algorithm uh, for false discovery rate control is designed only to improve upon Bonferroni. And what Bonferroni is doing is essentially eliminating log factors, avoiding union bounds, avoiding this term right here, this log x. And so if you are going to use this for testing, we have to improve this. And furthermore, we know that this term is not real in some cases. In some cases, in specific cases, I can remove that. And so the big question of this literature, or this work, is can we remove uh, this log x, and when can we remove it? And these are some of the biggest questions in active learning today, actually. When can you remove log factors? So in the last six minutes or so, or five minutes or so, um, I'm going to talk about uh, testing. Okay? So what do we know about it? What do these problems look like? Optimization is a very sort of intuitive sort of thing. When does, when does testing come up? So to motivate this a little bit, uh, I'm going to look at a very, very, very simple problem. So instead of having feature vectors of x's of these configurations of a bike, I'm going to say, actually, I have my theta star. Uh, it's some vector. But when I take a measurement, I just measure an independent element of it. And the way I'm going to do that is it's essentially I have pointwise measurements. I can get a noisy observation of the ith component of theta star at every time. And what does that mean? So as a motivating application, suppose I had, say, 13,000 genes of a Drosophila. And I'm interested in understanding which of these genes influence virus replication. So one way I could do this um, is I could, using RNAi, I could uh, knock out a single gene of these 13,000 genes. I could uh, 
put a fluorescing virus, I could uh, affect this fly with a fluorescing virus in a microarray, and then look at how much virus is there. So if I knock out the gene, I'm inhibiting it. And so if there's a lot of virus, when I knock out that one gene, that single gene, that means that genome is very important for inhibiting virus replication. If there was no change, meaning that when I knocked out this gene, nothing happened, it was the same amount of virus as the null case, when all the genes are there, that means there was no change. There was a zero change, and that means that that gene is totally ineffective. So what I can do is I can model each one of these. So the jth trial of the ith gene, when I knock out the ith gene for the jth time, I get some Gaussian random variable. It's very stylized, of course with some mean mu i. And what I'm saying is that no effect is when the difference between the null of when I knock out nothing and when I do knock out this, it, this mean is zero. I'm just getting noisy observations. These things are very noisy because the fluorescence is a very uh, noisy process. But then if there's some positive effect, meaning this virus is very uh, influential, this gene is very influential for inhibiting virus replication, then I'm going to get some positive effect. And so what I'm going to try to do is take some measurements adaptively take each gene knocked out sequentially, um, again, in this very stylized setting, so that I want to identify some big set S such that uh, I get a large intersection with those H1s that have large effects and small intersection with those effects that are completely null. Meaning I want to identify a lot of the uh, genes that are actually influential. So how does this look like? What, 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 would, this, what, what would this look like? In fact, is if we had uh, N genes, and we did just a non-adaptive sort of uh, measurement of all of them, we'd get uh, some empirical mean, these blue dots, the empirical means of these z-scores. We'd have some confidence intervals, because each one was taken a finite number of times. And I'm going to say these confidence intervals go down like something like square root of log n over the number of trials. Right? This is your standard sort of decay rate. Um, where log n is coming from the fact that I'm unibounding over all n genes, right? meaning that the true effect sizes are enclosed in these confidence intervals for all confidence intervals. And now as I take more and more measurements, these confidence intervals are going to shrink. And if I make a very simplistic you know, sort of observation, like, well, the confidence intervals that do not include zero are bigger than zero, so I'm going to select those to be my genes that actually are, this hypothesis that they are actually influential, their means are greater than zero, not equal to zero. And these other ones that include zero, I can't really say much about. So if you do this with a bond for any correction, doing this non-adaptive sort of sampling, of just sampling everything the same number of times, you get something that's like n delta minus 2 log n, where this, this capital delta is just the gap size between, say, a very simplistic model of either the gap is equal to delta or is equal to zero. Can we do better? And so can we remove this log n? The answer is yes. And I want to give you a feeling for how these algorithms work that avoid log factors. And before, we were making our algorithms before the, of the first part of this talk was very sort of non-adaptive in a way. It was doing successive stages of non-adaptive measurement, right? But we can't do that with these problems if we want to remove log factors. And so one algorithm that does this is an algorithm called Will ECB that essentially defines some upper confidence bound that looks like this. And it just, whatever, it looks very similar to the previous slide, except for it doesn't have a log n here, which means that the true means are not guaranteed to be included in these confidence intervals. They're not true confidence intervals. It's just an algorithm. So at each time, I, pull the, I, I sample the gene that maximizes this confidence interval, and I go on. If I keep doing this, you're basically minimizing the maximum confidence interval, and you're going to have one gene poke its head above all the other ones. You're just going to keep sampling that one. You can prove for optimization, if you treat it as an optimization problem, that gene that gets sampled more and more and more will be the best one will be the one that has the highest mean, will we'll solve this optimization problem, and you can write down stopping times and things that are optimal that remove that log x factor of before. And this is how you do an optimal optimization problem. But only in this very simple setting. And what we're going to do now for this testing problem is you can use this sort of setup, use your optimization to perform testing. Right? Because now I can reject this gene that looks like it's poking its head above all the rest and reject it and say that it is uh, a null, and I can repeat this process. So if you do that, you can define any time p-values and bond for any bond uh, engineering Hodgeberg procedures, and all this stuff goes through when you're doing things adaptively uh, with some uh, little changes. And you can essentially get a theorem that basically removes that 
uh, log n factor. You just get delta minus two n. And so the point of this is that if you're being non-adaptive versus adaptive, you can actually see really big gains. Large factors of um, constants. Say you can find things three times faster. And, but you have to be smart. And you have to be, to remove log factors is very difficult. Um, it actually works in theory, but also in practice. So this work, like I said, I came at this literature, these eternal design problems, from more of the e-commerce side of things. And I was actually working with a company called Optimizely at, a time, at the time. And they basically do A-B testing on the internet. If you, uh, they, where I worked with them to get my algorithm implemented, uh, and uh, it is, and it basically gave the customers that 3x speed up. And if you check CNN, New York Times, Fox News today, this morning, um, you hit my algorithm. Because what they do is they run the same exact process, not on genes, but on headlines, or on different subscription services. They're trying to do pure inference questions of what are the tactics that are actually effective so that we can take those insights and bring them to the next uh, stage, the next campaign. Um, and all sorts of companies actually work like this. Um, and so this stuff really does actually work in practice. Um, and there's a lot, but there's a lot more questions involving how do we generalize this to the more general covariate case. Um, and also, basically I talked about today the simplest possible setting, a linear model with mean zero Gaussian noise. It doesn't get any simpler than that. But even with that, there are still a number of open questions. And so what we'd like to do is get to more interesting function classes. Like we'd like to say, get to um, you know, general link functions, say with a logistic loss or something like that, or a fully nonlinear arbitrary parametric model, say a neural network or something like this. But I think they were a long way off from that because to understand how to take the next measurement to minimize uncertainty, you have to be able to quantify uncertainty. And that requires theoretical insights in order to do so. And I think that, uh, but a lot of the results that are coming out for deep learning are very exciting uh, over the last two years or so. Uh, but I still think we have a lot more to go there. Um, so I'll finish with that. Um, again, I'd like to thank my collaborators, uh, Jane, Tanner Fies, and Lillian. Um, and these are some citations for you. And thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. Uh, you talked about optimizing over the set of x's. And um, in the original case where you had the interaction terms, like set of x's seems very constrained because like, uh, the vector has to be kind of internally consistent with the interaction. Is an optimization like, easy or hard? Uh, oh, so the question is, um, when we were when we're doing an optimization over the x's, trying to figure out the one that has the large inner product with theta star, which is unknown, so we uh, have to do that. All the way back to here. So these x's, what do these x's look like? Um, these x's have structure to them because they're encoded through uh, these interaction terms. So the question is, you know, you have these x's that have this sort of odd shape to them. They can take sort of an arbitrary structure. And how do you do things? Um, how do you do particular, like, uh, these experimental design procedures over these x's? Is that a, a computationally efficient program? Um, and the answer is sometimes. Uh, it actually gets back to the fact that geoptimal design is equivalent to deoptimal design. And there's a ton of work on making deoptimal design efficient. In fact, Yintat uh, Lee in the computer science department had a paper just last year on um, improve, an improved algorithm for optimizing deoptimal design. So uh, these algorithms are computationally efficient-ish, um, but often are linear in the total number of vectors that you're considering. So if they're exponential in the dimension, yeah, you, you've got a problem. Other questions? OK, I have one quick question. Um, the uh, log factor of size of the, the whole experiment set yeah. came up in your bound. Where does it actually come from? Yeah, so because it comes up. one step of the inequality. Yeah, so it comes up um, by union bounding over all the possible things. So I lied to you. 
right here. This is this confidence bound. When I lower bound this random variable by this confidence bound here, this holds for this particular x with probability 1 minus delta. But if I want, for an upper bound version of this inequality, if I want this to hold for all x's simultaneously, I need a union bound over all possible ones. And so basically, a lot of the work right now is trying to, um, a lot of the more, most exciting work is trying to figure out how do I do adaptive sampling where I don't need to do these trivial union bounds or even trivial coverage using Dudley's integrals and things like this. You want, want to avoid uh, uh, naive chaining arguments because we know they can be avoided uh, in this uh, very simple set classes. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? If not, let's uh, thank Kevin again. Thanks very much. Thanks.